It appears that the dead are coming back to life and eating the flesh of the living. This is unbelievable news we're hearing. Uh, I, for one, am truly shocked. Zombie. A single word that has the power to instill a feeling of both deep-rooted fear and fascination upon hearing. Whether you discover them through video games, cinema, literature, or even a forced visit to your grandmother's house with smells of old age and cat piss, everyone has their zombie introduction story. Imagine this. You've been home from school for a couple of hours now. Your hunger meter's empty. Those cheese strings your mum packed in your lunchbox were devoured hours ago. Mummy, when's tea ready? I'm hungry. I'm bored of playing with my wrestling figures. Ten seconds later, she barges in your room with a plate of turkey twizzlers and a glass of Sunny D. You feel replenished. Your hunger meter's full again. You haven't wet the bed in at least 48 hours. Life is good. Suddenly, your peaceful, childish existence comes crashing to the ground when you hear moaning coming from your older brother's bedroom. You walk towards his dimly lit room and light from the TV bleeds from under the door. You slowly open it, and what do you see on the other side? Dead people. Dead people that have just smashed through a f***ing window and are now eating a man on the other side. Well, this is exactly what happened to me. And although I was terrified, it also sparked within me a love of all things zombie. Which is why I've decided to compile a list and share with you 20 of the creepiest zombie details in video games. Some of these are horror games with a focus on zombies, Others are the complete opposite of horror that feature surprisingly horrific zombie or otherwise undead related moments. Oh, and every single detail I cover today are things that I have personally fallen victim to in the last 20 years. I'm freelance, pal. I don't make my living waiting for the TV to tell me what to cover. <laughs> I really hope you enjoy. Knock, knock! Oh, you right, Mum? Yeah, I thought you might be hungry, Tom. Oh, cheers, thank you. Cheers. Number 1. Resident Evil 2 1998 Certain zombies play dead and watch your every move. The original Resident Evil 2 is arguably the most iconic zombie game ever made, and no self-respecting list of 20 creepiest zombie details should start without it. Unlike the remake which begins outside of a nondescript gas station, 1998's Resident Evil 2 immediately throws players in the deep end by surrounding them with numerous Claire or Leon hungry zombies. Now when we think of the word zombie, most people will agree that a zombie is either an undead or infected individual that seeks to eat or otherwise kill the living. We typically associate zombies, especially back in 1998, as clumsy and slow moving, but most importantly having limited brain function. At no point should something as primitive as a zombie be able to plan ahead or consciously ambush their victim, so you can imagine it took players by surprise when discovering that zombies in Resident Evil can in fact play dead after being knocked to the ground, choosing instead to lie dormant and wait patiently for an ankle snack rather than rising to their feet. Ah, my ankle. The first time it happens is a shock, but from that point on you know what to expect, that a downed zombie isn't necessarily a dead one. When you first arrive at the Raccoon Police Department, you will find that certain rooms within the RPD's halls already contain dead police officers that met their demise prior to your arrival. At least, that's what the game wants you to think. Phew, they're already dead, nothing to worry about. But, if you stay on high alert and pay close attention, a shiver-inducing detail can be spotted. The ones still alive will turn their heads to follow you as you navigate the room. At no point do they stand up, instead they prefer to study your every move in case you get within chomping distance. Zombies could also play dead in the first Resident Evil, but it wasn't until its sequel that the developers added this horrifying head movement, conveying that the zombies still retained a level of foresight. I generally think of zombies to be mindless shambling corpses driven by an insatiable appetite, so when my six year old self hid behind a blanket and watched my brother play the game, I had to do a double take to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. I don't think I slept that night. Number 2. Elden Ring. Crucified corpses scream in anguish at night. Whilst not zombies in the traditional sense, Elden Ring's concept of life and undeath is well worth discussing, with death and resurrection being a staple in the entire Souls Bakiro Ring series. Yeah, you heard that right. <laughs> Souls Bakiro Ring. I'm not sure if that phrase has ever been said before, but I'm running with it. Now you probably didn't click this video for a lecture, so I'll try and explain this as succinctly as possible, keeping in mind that the story in Elden Ring, like, well, all FromSoft games, can be vague and enigmatic, so hopefully I'm explaining this adequately. You are tarnished. Someone whose misdeeds in life upset the golden order enough for you to be banished from the realm. 
Being exiled resulted in your death, but through the shattering of the Elden Ring, you were resurrected and made to serve the Golden Order. What Golden Order? The Golden Order once more by venturing on an arduous journey to become Elden Lord. You are on a path of redemption of sorts to restore the Elden Ring, and whilst you're not the only tarnished beckoned by lost grace, others apparently were not destined for this. Throughout the game, you will come across groups of crucified corpses littering the lands between. But if being crucified wasn't awful enough, that was only the beginning for these unfortunate souls. During the day, as unsightly as they are, the only discomfort you'll face is seeing their burning charred corpses as you ride past them. During the night, however, the very same corpses come to life and will scream in anguish until sunrise. This horrible fate is at the hands of Queen Marika the Eternal, ruler of the lands between and vessel for the Elden Ring. Wanting to create a world free from death and grant her followers eternal life, she removed the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring. But as a result of this, Sinus who refused to follow Marika's rule were destined each night to suffer ad infinitum. You cannot interact with them, you cannot finish them off with an arrow to the knee, you cannot destroy the crucifix and set them free, nothing you do will save them. How bloody awful. Number 3. Dying Light. Virals retain an essence of humanity. Call me old-fashioned, but I don't tend to like it when books, games and films rock the zombie-infested boat a little too hard. Zombies that can communicate, zombies that can fall in love, it's a pet peeve of mine and really rubs me the wrong way. I prefer zombies to be just that, zombies. Stupid, shambling, insatiable, smelly and slow. Useless alone, but power in numbers. I also love the more modern interpretation, whereby the infected are still very much alive and retain a high degree of motor function, therefore being able to sprint and climb, but are often at the mercy of starvation and blood loss, much like a normal human. Dying Light has both. Newly infected 28 Days Later-esque zombies known as virals, and aged decaying Romero-esque zombies known as biters. Virals are considerably more threatening due to their heightened speed and agility, and are infamous for being able to pinpoint the player's location and close the distance regardless of how high up you are. Whilst not the strongest type of zombie you'll encounter, virals are particularly adept at ambushing the player and dodging your attacks. But if you do manage to land a hit however, a lesser known and rather heartbreaking detail can be observed when fighting a viral. Because the infection has not yet completely sunk its teeth into the victim's neurological system, there is a small chance that the infected individual will beg for their lives. This brief display of humanity is sadly short-lived as the virus will seize control again moments later, causing the infected to let out a dreadful scream before continuing the chase. This detail carries with it the awful implication that the attacker still retains a degree of self-awareness, but is utterly powerless to overcome it for any length of time. This has to be one of the saddest, most unforgettable details I've ever encountered. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Number 4. Dead Rising 3. Destroying the brain won't always stop a zombie. Zombie media tells us that in order to kill a zombie you must remove the head or destroy the brain. Apparently that rule does not apply to Dead Rising 3. As a lover of the previous two Dead Rising games, the first one in particular, I couldn't wait to explore Dead Rising 3's denser, open world city setting and witness all the improvements the game had to offer. But with a huge city comes an equally huge population that wants to gobble your grey matter. You might assume that the insane increase of zombies might cause the developers to maybe cut corners a little bit? Add less detail to the zombies? Quantity over quality type of thing? <coughs> Resident Evil 3 remake removing ragdoll physics. <coughs> well, part of me wishes that was the case, but it really isn't. When playing the game back when it was first released, I vividly remember escaping a horde of zombies by entering a house and unsurprisingly being greeted by several residents inside. I dispatched all but one with a pistol I'd gotten my hands on, but ran out of ammo before finishing off the last zombie. This was the perfect opportunity to see what the fire axe was capable of, and I did a strong attack that split it down the middle. Now you could chop zombies in half in the older games, but it always resulted in their death, so besides being impressed by the new high-res gory graphics, it didn't come as much of a surprise. I begin looting the house again, and all of a sudden, I feel like something isn't quite right. You know, besides being at the epicentre of a zombie apocalypse. You ever have this sort of instinctual feeling that you're not alone? Well, that's exactly what happened to me, and upon panning the camera behind me were my worries proven to be justified. Crawling towards me was the same zombie I had kill billed moments prior, admittedly in a bit of a half-hearted, well, bodied attempt, but my god was that unexpected. That's right, zombies can now survive being cut in half, not just horizontally but vertically too. Bear in mind that zombies on nightmare mode are a lot tougher. 
On story mode, the game's normal difficulty, zombies will almost always die when doing this, so unless you play on nightmare mode you're likely to miss it. Not exactly a hidden detail, but one definitely overlooked by a lot of players. Seeing what was once a human crawling towards me with half a body still intent on ending my life genuinely made this one of my most unexpected experiences in over 20 years of gaming. In fact, I was so taken aback by this I even screenshotted it and uploaded it to Steam back in 2014. Horrific is an understatement. Number 5. Dark Souls 3. Several bodies don't appreciate being looted. The Dark Souls series takes the player on a jaded journey through castles, crypts, caves and catacombs and Blighttown, but the less said about Blighttown the better. By the time Dark Souls 3 rolls around, players will be well accustomed to looting lost souls. The act of pilfering from a person long past shouldn't particularly perturb the player until you reach Irithyll Dungeon. Taking the earlier games into consideration, you've probably looted a thousand bodies up to this point. So why should those laying around Irithyll Dungeon be any different? Well, this was clearly a point of contention for the developers who decided to punish players that had been long conditioned to looting the dead unscathed. As you make your way through this abominable asylum of failed experiments, three of the many victims will let out a truly blood-curdling scream upon being stripped to their last essence of humanity. What might seem like a cheap jump scare to most can actually be avoided by truly perceptive players, for the three victims in question can actually be seen rocking back and forth slightly. Although brutish bosses and bodeful biomes have been prevalent in the Souls series from the very beginning, with Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 leaning more into themes of horror than previous entries, looting corpses up until this point has never posed a threat, so the vast majority of players will find themselves with a dung pie in their inventory shortly thereafter. Number 6. Resident Evil 2 Remake The Sheriff Wants Justice for Being Interrupted The second of three Resident Evil appearances in this list, this time the faithful yet refreshing remake of the already discussed Resident Evil 2. As mentioned earlier, 2019's remake has players begin their nightmare outside of a nondescript gas station on the outskirts of Raccoon City. Leading up to the entrance of the building are bloody footprints, alluding to a grisly scene inside. As Claire or Leon race to help, they interrupt a confrontation between Arkley County Sheriff Daniel Cortini and an unarmed assailant. Unaware of his affliction, Daniel attempts to detain the suspect to no avail, and is made even less effective when the protagonist inadvertently distracts him, causing the zombie to get the upper hand and take a bite out of his throat. At this point, most players will avenge the sheriff, nab the key from the cabinet, run past Jerry and get the hell out of Dodge. But if you freeze and panic for too long, or decide to make your last stand and defeat the remaining infected, the sheriff, now zombified, will jump scare you if you attempt to re-enter the back room. I love details like this. Unexpected, even unnecessary details that developers spend their time implementing, even though the vast majority of players will probably miss it. What makes this even more likely to be missed is that the sheriff won't zombify for a good 30 seconds. If you leave the room, then immediately attempt to run back in, the jump scare won't trigger. Only after the virus realistically has time to zombify him does he get up off the ground. Number 7. Rugrats Search for Reptar A creepy toy will chase curious explorers Rugrats, I hear you say? How did an iconic children's series turn surprisingly awesome video game get on a list about walking flesh-hungry corpses? Well, the game is actually way creepier than you might think. For a start, it was released on Halloween of 1998 in North America, the same year as Resident Evil 2 I might add, and if that wasn't foreboding enough, also features survival horror elements. Yeah, you heard me right. A video game based on children, made for children, with an E for everyone rating, including children, can actually be associated with survival horror. Rugrats Search for Reptar has the player explore the Pickles residence in search of 11 missing pieces to Tommy's jigsaw puzzle. Where's my reptile puzzle? Who? Come to think of it. Throughout the house are objects you can interact with in order to play different levels, and some of them are unexpectedly unsettling. For instance, one of the levels has you explore the house in the dead of night in order to free the light from the fridge after your father causes a power outage. Simple enough task, right? Wrong. Throughout the house are shadow monsters, a figment of Tommy's imagination that my five-year-old brain perceived as reality. On your quest to free the light from the fridge, said shadow monsters will stalk and attack the player. You can fight back with your flashlight, but the survival horror element stems from needing to replenish its constantly depleting battery and your health bar via batteries and cookies respectively that are hidden around the house. Both are a limited resource that, if not managed correctly, can result in a game over. But on to what this video is really about. Zombies. 
Tommy's father Stu is an inventor of children's toys primarily as a way to bond with his son. These toys however are unintentionally terrifying, often malfunction and much like the undead seek to harm the living. One of the other mini games, Ice Cream Mountain sees the player take on 9 different rounds of Crazy Golf with each round becoming progressively more challenging than the last. The penultimate level in particular proves difficult to get through for an entirely different reason. Being themed after an Egyptian setting, the player will find several pyramids dotted around this level's map. At first glance they appear to be nothing more than set dressing, but curious adventurers will spot an opening behind one of the pyramids leading to an inner sanctum, and if the player wants to reap the rewards they will be forced to journey inside. Brave treasure hunters will find a stash of hidden reptile bars situated throughout the halls, 15 of which are needed to complete the game fully. However, this jackpot comes at a cost. Lurking somewhere within the tomb is a single mummy, one of your father's inventions, a Mr. Friend toy wrapped in what looks to be toilet paper, but this mummy is not your friend and will chase the player whenever they get close. Unlike other minigames in which your father's failed creation can physically harm the player, this version can only harm you psychologically. And believe me when I say, many sleepless nights have been had by children all around the world who were caught off guard by this encounter. But if you manage to lure the mummy outside, Payback can be had when the mummy is exposed to sunlight. Wait patiently at the foot of the pyramid and Mr. Friend will soon become Mr. Fried, a fitting end for such a freaky creation. <laughs> Number 8. Tony Hawk's Underground 2. A hospital harbours a sinister secret. The Tony Hawk series is venerated for its myriad of funny and creative secrets and easter eggs, the developer's obsession with goats, a nod to the Mortal Kombat series, a poop-throwing monkey minigame, and one really satisfying alternate ending. It has it all. The series is also known for its huge variety of levels, many of which were inspired by or set in real-world locations. Venice Beach and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, Alcatraz and Pro Skater 4, the Brooklyn Banks and Tony Hawk's Underground, with Easter eggs hidden around practically every level. <laughs> However, not all easter eggs are amusing, some are downright spooky. The very sunny and inviting Barcelona of Thug 2 for instance harbours an insidious secret that took many a player by surprise. Found in this level is a building based on a real world hospital called Hospital San Pau. Over 600 years ago, six smaller hospitals merged under one roof after the Black Plague spread throughout Barcelona in 1348, killing a third of the population, resulting in the realisation that a unified healthcare was the best course of action, but after 80 years of use was moved to a new premises in 2009. Well, Thug 2 was released in 2004, meaning the hospital was still in use and hidden in plain sight through one of the second story windows can a bloodstained stretcher be seen shaking violently as if the body underneath the blanket is desperately trying to free itself. You could argue it's not necessarily a zombie, but stumbling upon an abandoned blood soaked stretcher shaking unrelentingly would make me piss my pants at the best of times, and I've seen enough horror movies and played enough games to know that bodies under blankets are usually best left well alone. Furthermore, if we take a look at the entire building, you'll notice it's under construction. Could the body under the sheet be patient zero? Could they be urgently trying to barricade it from the outside world? Either way, it's obvious this hospital is hiding something sinister. Another interesting fact is that this easter egg is only visible in the PS2 version of the game. On GameCube, PC and Xbox, nothing appears to be on the other side of the window. For a long time it was assumed that the bed was removed or hidden due to being too graphic, but a brilliant YouTuber called Oddheader managed to get in touch with a series producer on the Tony Hawk series, who upon being interviewed mentioned that they had issues with texture transparency on other platforms, which is likely why the room appears to be empty, when in reality there's something in front of your very eyes as it tries to claw at them. Number 9. Resident Evil Outbreak Bob's Difficulty Level Related Jump Scare when I was a kid, I tended to play games on their easiest difficulty setting. I don't know what the catalyst was, but once I reached a certain age, I did a complete 180 and now almost always play games on their hardest difficulty from the get-go. I don't often like replaying games, I prefer to immerse myself in the story the first time around and struggle alongside the character. In fact, my first and only playthrough of The Last of Us was done on grounded difficulty and I loved every minute. That being said, limiting yourself to a certain difficulty level can sometimes lock you out of specific content. Playing the US version of Streets of Rage 3 on easy mode for example will stop you from progressing beyond the fifth level, leaving the fate of the police chief in the hands of the bad guys. Resident Evil Outbreak features a similar difficulty related destiny for one of the characters, except this time playing on an easier difficulty is arguably the better fate. Meet Bob. Spoiler alert, Bob's buggered. While going out for a drink with colleague and friend Mark Wilkins, Bob falls unconscious at the same moment a zombie bursts through the door, and although the zombie never touches Bob, I feel the hunger. Bob's still infected, having drunk from a T-virus contaminated water supply. Bob resigns himself to his fate, and on easy, normal and hard, he takes matters into his own hands and proverbially bites the bullet once the player helps carry him to the roof. Bob! 
On Very Hard, the cutscene starts the same, but it then comes as a shock when he instead succumbs to the virus and turns into a zombie, leaving the player with very little opportunity to escape. To add salt to the wounds, the gun Bob uses to avoid turning into a zombie is nowhere to be found on this difficulty, meaning there's no reward for carrying him to the roof other than to achieve 100%. This sneaky, difficulty-specific alteration to a cutscene in an already notoriously challenging game, especially when playing in single player, is an incredibly memorable jump scare, and stands out among other jump scares in the series. Do you know of any more difficulty-specific scary moments? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10. Hitman Blood Money Undeath on the Mississippi The Hitman series takes you on a globetrotting adventure from the glitz and glamour of a Paris fashion show to the seedy, blood-soaked underbelly of a slaughterhouse fetish party. But between some of the more grandiose, or gross, get-togethers as 47 granted some downtime, one of the more low-key levels is set on board a riverboat travelling down the Mississippi in which you are tasked with eliminating six members of the Gator Gang, as well as their leader, Skip Muldoon. This level is misleadingly large, with multiple floors and a mixture of open and closed spaces. Because of this, players might decide to take advantage of the ship's spacious engine room to dispose of the level's many NPCs. But if you happen to use this room to hide the body of a sailor by throwing them from the right railing and a Gators gang member from the left railing, you have inadvertently turned the entire ship's passengers into assassin-craving zombies. Every NPC will know exactly where you are at all times and slowly make their way towards you. And unless you shoot them in the head, they will eventually rise to their feet and resume the hunt. I remember this easter egg terrifying me as a kid. Nowadays though, it just makes me laugh that zombies spend half the time shadowboxing and will actually punch each other if they get too close to one another. And as clever as it was for the developers to use the dragging animation as a shamble, it does look a bit silly. That being said, the entire Hitman series is known for its obscure and outrageous secrets and easter eggs, many of which are very funny, but some are intended to send shivers down your spine. Hitman Contracts, undeniably the darkest game in the series with an oppressive soundtrack and every level set on a stormy night, is home to the scariest easter egg of them all. In Traditions of the Trade, the ghost of a murdered man roams the halls of a hotel wing and appears behind you when you look in the mirror, but won't be visible when you turn around in shock. What's more creepy is that if you fire your gun where the ghost was initially floating, blood will stain the walls every time you shoot. And believe it or not, you can kill, well, re-kill the ghost. If you enter the haunted wing of the hotel and run towards the end of the hall as quickly as you can, you can actually fiber wire the ghost before he has a chance to disappear through the wall. Number 11. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. All is not well. Rainbow Six Siege initially received a lot of criticism when announced due to the shift from the series' prior single-player and co-op-centric games into its first foray into a predominantly full-scale multiplayer venture. If that wasn't aggravating enough, Siege rubbed salt in the wounds by debuting shortly after the cancellation of Rainbow Six Patriots, a story-focused single-player game that would force the player to see through the perspectives of characters on both sides. The game had controversial themes such as domestic terrorism and players would be faced with ethical dilemmas such as killing civilians without repercussion if taking the lives of few spared the lives of many. It was intended to be dark, serious and thought-provoking. So, when footage of Rainbow Six Siege was revealed featuring cheesy voice acting and gameplay not entirely representative of the final product, the whole thing reeked of stolen valour. Because of these reasons, many people assumed the game was destined to fail, but over time Siege has proven itself through its dedication to adding new operators with fleshed out backstories, numerous maps and limited time events, some with unique game modes and cutscenes to give it a more story-driven feel. One of the events in question, Outbreak. Outbreak pitted teams of three players against a swarm of mutated enemies after a falling meteorite struck Earth and let forth the Chimera Parasite. Fast forward to the next season, Operation Parabellum, whereby players found themselves inside a beautiful Italian villa surrounded by countryside, a much more grounded, peaceful and infection-free setting. Well, as long as whatever's below stays six feet under. Now I've heard conflicting reports, some people think it's a zombie, some people think it's an alien, and some people think it's a poor Italian man being waterboarded. Now I personally think it's a callback to Outbreak, which later served as the inspiration for Rainbow Six Extraction, but seeing a boarded up well is very reminiscent of zombie media, even if the thing in the well is of extraterrestrial origin. Number 12. Killing Floor 2. One of the specimens has a droopy detail. When I was a kid, watching my uncle play Battlefield 2 online and shooting real players absolutely blew me away and opened my eyes to the epic world of online gaming. After begging my mum for months to buy me a gaming PC, I'm browsing Steam one day and discover a lesser known game called Killing Floor. 
The Killing Floor series of games are survival horror co-op first-person shooters in which the player and up to five other teammates survive against waves of laboratory-created specimens. As you and your merry band of mercenaries progress through each wave, you will encounter increasingly tougher and creepier enemy archetypes. This is the Flesh Pound, a Herculean mesomorph intended to be a super soldier, now turned super specimen, and is more than willing to use his meat mallets to turn you into tomato puree. But the Flesh Pound isn't the only specimen with an affinity for cutlery. May I introduce you to this cleaver-wielding, boil-covered brute branded the Bloat. Hello there, you big bastard. It's like Play-Doh had an evil kid. <coughs> the Bloat has been a staple of the Killing Floor series since the very beginning, where the game started off as a modification to Unreal Tournament 2004, almost 20 years ago. As each subsequent game has become more sophisticated than the last, so too has the physics engine, with Killing Floor 2 allowing for real-time particle simulation. In plain English, blood and bile dynamically drench the environment. Puke pools in a pile, blood drips from the ceiling, and intestines get entangled as they flop through the air. But not only is the bloat a boil-covered brute, he's a bouncy boil-covered brute. Before I go any further, I'd like to read you an excerpt from Wikipedia on... Jiggle Physics. In video games, breast physics, or jiggle physics, are a feature that makes a female character's breasts bounce when she moves, sometimes in an exaggerated or unnatural manner. Clearly, whoever wrote that has never played Killing Floor 2, as the bloat proves it's not just limited to female characters. It seems the developers weren't content with creating a grotesquely gargantuan grenade on legs. No, they decided to take it to another vile level and give this bouncy boy jiggle physics to really accentuate the bloat's flabby form. Now I concur this isn't a traditionally creepy attention to detail, but I challenge you to think of anything more terrifying than getting up close and personal with this. I think I'd rather be eaten alive. Number 13. Project Zomboid. Post-Zombie Stress Disorder. If you had told me 10 years ago that Project Zomboid would become the best zombie survival game ever made, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Back in the old days, presumptuous players like myself might be forgiven for assuming the game lacked substance and replay value. Its isometric perspective and pixel art style was reminiscent of an old Java game. Which it is. That's right. Project Zomboid is in fact written in Java, but gone are the days where the game looked like this, and instead now looks like this. It wasn't until I downloaded the game on Azure way back when and played it for myself that I discovered the game is in fact one of the most sophisticated, engaging and heart-pounding games I would ever have the pleasure of playing. Throughout its 10 plus year development cycle, the game has seen multiple art style shifts, with features being added and removed in order to be perfected, and some not by choice. Irrespectively, the game has gone from strength to strength, and under its somewhat cartoony hand-drawn exterior lies a game that provides the most grounded, realistic zombie survival experience available today. But if being jump scared by a sneaky shambler wasn't enough, so too can your character, suffering the psychological consequences alongside you. Like a real person, characters have a myriad of needs, emotions and physical states. They experience hunger and thirst, sleep deprivation, exhaustion, boredom, inebriation and sobriety, illness, blood loss and of course, fear. But one standout feature that existed in the game for a time and will likely see its return in an even creepier fashion alongside the planned insanity feature was the ability to hallucinate. When your character is bitten, you're infected. No ifs, ands or buts. It's only a matter of time before you succumb to the virus. On the other scratch covered hand however, a zombie that manages to graze you will leave you second guessing. There's a chance you're infected, but you won't know until it's too late. Unknowingly infected players that began to zombify would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night surrounded by zombies, but upon running downstairs would find that their doors and windows were still boarded shut, besides some particularly unlucky players encountering a glitch that would respawn zombies inside their safely secured home. Characters that were in the process of joining the undead ranks had a chance of witnessing their inevitable future in the form of a horrifying hallucination. Note that this could also occur when extremely scared or tired, leaving a real uncertainty as to the fate of an injured character. Number 14. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Decapitated ass zombies. <laughs> Turn back if you value your life. You can't behead the headless. Our swords and pikes did nothing. This very ominous but accurate warning sign flips the law of what we consider a zombie on its head, or lack thereof, and just how a zombie would go about consuming their victims without one. Now it's been a while since I last played Sekiro, and to remind myself of this entry I had decapitated ass zombies written down. For anyone unfamiliar with Sekiro, you're about to see why. You truly returned from the dead. Now, as much as I wish decapitated ass zombies was their official name, these terrifying undead monstrosities are simply referred to as the Headless. 
Their shocking appearance, combined with the unsettling music and inhuman guttural sound effects, unnerves even seasoned Sekiro players. With fans online claiming to be several cycles into New Game Plus and still choosing to avoid these encounters. Up to this point, we can agree on the word decapitated, on account of them having one less head than the average person, and zombie, on account of them being undead and seeking to harm the living. But where does arse fit in? <laughs> Well, I'm not talking about the bum-revealing Fandoshi each headless wears, but rather something that the headless insist on doing to yours. Enemies can physically attack the wolf in one of two ways, standard attacks and perilous attacks, with the headless having both attack types up their neck-shaped sleeve. Standard attacks can be guarded against with your katana, either reducing incoming damage or nullifying it completely. Perilous attacks, on the other hand, are much more devastating and require the wolf to parry the attack at the right moment or stay out of arm's reach if the enemy attempts to grab them. And unless you want your dignity to be violated as well as your health, you're going to want to avoid this perilous attack at all costs. Let's just say this attack takes the fun out of Fandoshi. In Japanese folklore, the soul is said to be found inside you. Where exactly, <laughs> you might ask? Well, remember that white thing you just saw? That's a shirikodama, which translates into English as, wait for it, <laughs> small anus ball. <laughs> The Headless are believed to be based on a type of yokai, a suspicious supernatural entity called the Kappa. The Kappa are believed to be soulless demons that reside in water seeking their missing soul. And when the Kappa successfully extracts this, and I quote, delicious delicacy from their victim, they consume it. But most Kappas have a head and a mouth, so how does that which has no head consume an anus ball? That's how. For those who believe in the afterlife, well, take solace in knowing your key to eternal paradise is safely contained within your small anus ball, as long as a headless arse zombie doesn't steal it first. Number 15. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. The dead linger on Snake's conscience in player-specific ways. Now I've taken some liberties with this entry as they're technically not zombies, but the fact they shamble like zombies and attempt to grab and damage the player is why I've deemed them worthy of appearing on this list. Hear me out. Metal Gear Solid needs no introduction. On top of the series is gripping, elaborate and very real themes of global conspiracy, shadow organisations and geopolitical warfare, Metal Gear is also widely known for its supernatural elements, toying with players' expectations and keeping them on their toes. Interwoven into the series is genetic makeup of specific characters, easter eggs and story moments that add a horror-themed flair to each game. And today we are going to discuss one specific story moment in the form of a boss fight that pits the player against a seemingly endless wave of undead. Or does it? At one point during Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater's story, Naked Snake will do an Assassin's Creed style leap of faith into a river in order to avoid being killed by Revolver Ocelot. The impact causes Snake to fall unconscious and later wake up in an endless river situated in a forest engulfed by flame. Snake has entered the spirit realm, a purgatory-like state between life and death, and is greeted by the ghost of a man called the Sorrow, a boss who forces Snake to be confronted by those whose lives he has ended. Most players will find themselves navigating their way past countless walking corpses, and as unsettling as this is, is surprisingly contextual. Who, in the spirit realm, the player encounters, how many there are, and even their reactions depends on the player's past actions leading up to this point. If you do a lot of hunting, the corpses of dead animals will float past you, including fish and even a parrot for those who particularly enjoy annoying animal rights activists. Other encounters include undead with blood-soaked fatigues that will shamble past you, screaming in panic that their head's about to fall off if you make a habit of slitting your enemy's throats. And if you have a penchant for shooting penises, enemies will berate you for stopping them from ever creating a family. But one particularly unsettling encounter can occur if a cannibalistic series of steps are followed. If you kill an enemy, wait for a vulture to feast on their corpse, then kill and eat that same vulture, the corpse of that enemy will scream in anguish that the player ate them. Lastly, and this is where it gets really interesting, if you make a point of not killing any enemies during your playthrough, no ghosts will appear, only those of previously defeated bosses. This isn't even technically your fault considering they're fitted with a microbomb that is set to detonate on defeat, even if you overcome them non-lethally. I find this boss fight both fascinating and chilling because every single player has a unique repercussion as a direct result of their actions. And whilst they're not zombies in the true sense of the word, you've essentially caused each enemy to rise from the dead and haunt you in a walking nightmare, forever lingering on your conscience. Only pacifists will leave this encounter unscathed. 
Number 16, Red Dead Redemption 2. Causing an elderly mother to die alone has unexpected consequences. As a long-time fan of Rockstar Games as, well, games, Red Dead Redemption 2 feels like a culmination of the best aspects of their previous works. Namely, GTA 4's grounded story and huge number of interiors to explore, and GTA 5's scripted events that add depth and variety to its large open world. But unlike the GTA series' luxury sports cars, jetpacks and hoverbikes to traverse the map with, Red Dead's slower paced gameplay makes exploring the world much more intimate and rewarding. One of the places players most stumble upon during their travels is this curious little cabin. But if curiosity kills the cat, inside can a cantankerous old crone be found? Let me give you some advice. Turn around. Walk out of here. Get far, far away. Ain't so tough now, are you? Meet Mama Watson, proud owner of Watson's Cabin and the mother and leader of the Watson Boys. Upon your first visit to her cabin, she mistakes you for a gang-affiliated friend of the family and tells you to leave the loot in the cellar. Once you've robbed her blind, however, she comes to her senses and becomes incensed. If you leave the cabin and return another day, the aforementioned Watson boys make their first and final appearance. Now, Mama Watson is the brains of the family, but if you manage to kill her entire offspring, the brawn of the family, and leave her to suffer in silence, she will be oddly quiet the third time you visit, on account of her being dead and having no one to look after her. If you can stomach stepping into her bedroom and approaching her decaying corpse, you will be in for a shocking sight when she stares back at you, blinking every few moments. The player gets given the option to pull her quilt down, and if you do, she will stop blinking and instead give a ghastly grin, leaving you to question whether she's truly passed on or is still very much present. But if you decide you've not inflicted enough tragedy on this family, return to the cabin a fourth time, the bed will now be empty, minus the uh, dead skin and decay she left behind. Did someone move the body, or did she move herself? Is this a glitch, or perhaps an easter egg alluding to an Undead Nightmare sequel? In my opinion, it's probably a glitch the Rockstar are well aware of, but have decided to keep it in the game as a harmless yet horrifying discovery. <laughs> Number 17. Stalker Series. Zombies long to see their loved ones. For anyone unfamiliar with Stalker, let me give you a brief backstory. The Stalker series takes place in an alternate timeline years after the Chernobyl disaster. However, its origins begin way back in the 1960s where a Soviet-controlled government agency named the Institute of Crop Selection and Genetics were actually researching consciousness control, or mind control, under the guise of increasing food production throughout the Soviet Union. A separate group, aptly named The Group, takes interest in the exclusion zone for the seclusion it provides, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 further aiding to maintain their privacy. Using the funds from the Institute which became a front for the group to procure equipment and further their goals, their aim was to influence the New Sphere, the sphere of human thought and the third in a succession of phases of the Earth's development after the Geosphere, inanimate matter, and the Biosphere, biological life. But rather than being a social concept like in real life, the new sphere in the Stalker universe is a tangible field surrounding the Earth which affects and is affected by human thoughts, and in theory could therefore be influenced by humankind. The group embarked on a project named the Sea Consciousness, creating a superconsciousness composed of seven volunteers that believed that when united, would be able to rid the world of negative human emotion, greed, conflict and war through alteration of the new sphere. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and in doing so, a tear occurred in the new sphere which enabled it to directly influence the biosphere, creating an area around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant that defied understanding of modern science, resulting in a hotbed of warring factions, mutated creatures and otherworldly anomalies. This area of land, thanks to now what is known as the second disaster, is referred to as the Zone. When word got out that such a place existed, people from all walks of life came to visit the Zone. Some to find fortune, others to escape the law, you name it. As the rift in the new sphere continued to expand, so did the zone, causing the group to utilise more desperate measures to defend themselves from outside interference as they attempted to contain it. The group seized control of former military installations and one particularly deadly, or walking deadly, installation called the Brain Scorcher. The Brain Scorcher would generate sire missions to anyone that ventured too close to the group's whereabouts, the centre of the zone. Lucky escapees would endure short-term memory loss and hallucinations. Those not so lucky would suffer permanent brain damage and essentially zombify, losing most of their cognitive abilities and becoming a walking husk. From a distance, these zombified individuals look no different from a normal person. They warm themselves by campfires, eat food, use binoculars and so on. But this is where Stalker's interpretation of zombies becomes particularly sad if you happen to speak Russian. Like most zombies, they will shamble, moan and attack anyone unaffected but somewhere within their broken brain remains fragments of old memories from their lives before the zone. Sneak up to a zombie unnoticed and you can overhear them telling their daughter they'll be home soon, that they've grown so big, and other heart-wrenching phrases. 
And we'll even call out for their mother when bleeding to death. Perhaps this detail isn't traditionally scary, but it's traumatising nonetheless to think that these hollow shells are destined to live in a state of perpetual suffering until you put them out of their misery. Number 18. Forbidden Siren. Every enemy you encounter is truly unique. After learning of a killing spree that took place decades prior, 18-year-old Kyo Yasuda cycles to Hanuda village, the scene of the crime, and chances upon a cult performing a ritual in the middle of a forest. Having been spotted, he sprints away in panic but suddenly sees visions of himself from someone else's perspective. He turns around in bewilderment and there stands a police officer aiming a gun with every intention of killing him. Kyoya has inherited the ability to perform clairvoyance and was seeing through the eyes of the cop, Tetsuo Ishida. Something is very wrong with Tetsuo and Kyoya manages to escape on foot, eventually stealing a car but accidentally running over Tetsuo, killing him. As Kyoya inspects the body in disbelief, he hears the disorienting drone of a siren and shortly thereafter the police officer raises from the dead and shoots the boy through the heart, then proceeds to, uh... Well, whatever that is. Through the siren's blare, the police officer has become a Shibito, the first of many afflicted villagers you will be forced to endure. But you cannot kill that which is already dead, meaning that you will only be able to incapacitate a Shibito for a set time before it staggers back to its feet, similar to Mr. X or Nemesis in the Resident Evil games. Many games reuse assets such as 3D models and textures to save on memory and space, even to this day. The Forbidden Siren developers took it to another level by using a facial capture rig to take photos of actors for every single character in the game, capturing numerous facial expressions from eight different angles and then attaching them to faceless 3D models. Keep in mind that this game was released on PS2 back in 2006 and was very impressive for its time. The result is a mixture of uncanny valley yet undeniably unsettling encounters when you open a door to see an insane bald man staring and grinning maniacally at you, with a set of expressions completely unique to his character. On top of this, unlike most games whose NPCs share sound effects such as Resident Evil zombie moans or GTA pedestrian sounds, my mother's my sister. almost every enemy has unique sound effects for when they're passive, alerted or aggro to the player's presence. The fact the devs made tons of one-off expressions and sounds for each person plagued by this curse is two parts impressive and distressing, adding a thick layer of tension to each encounter by making every infected inhabitant of Fenuda Village truly unique. Fans of Forbidden Siren, who do you think is the creepiest character? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the dog being the scariest NPC was intentional though. Number 19, Saints Row 2006. Eye for an eye, zombie surprise. I'm sure you don't need me to remind you that the Saints Row series is a shadow of its former self, and thanks to the newest release, is practically dead in the water. Oh, I love you, but I'm allergic. Gone are the days of having complex characters with ulterior motives that impact the rise and fall and resurrection of the Saints. Emotional, gut wrenching cutscenes and a morally grey protagonist fueled by a desire for power. And instead, we have a gang that is fueled by friendship. I'm not sure that's how it works. Yeah, don't try to figure it out. But do you know what else is dead in the water? Or rather, who else? Meet Lynn, a once beautiful badass and the only female character that rose through the ranks after the gang's initial formation, becoming one of the OG lieutenants in the Third Street Saints. Because of this, Lynn's death comes as a massive shock when she meets her grim end at the bottom of the ocean having had her cover blown when working undercover in the rollers. But this isn't the last we see of Lynn, or what's left of her. As you shoot your way through Stillwater, you may have spotted an eye for an eye being advertised on posters and billboards. Many games feature fake companies and advertisements such as GTA and Cyberpunk to add more believability to the world, some including phone numbers that cannot be called. In Saints Row, however, this phone number is very much in service. Prior to Lynn's death, calling it will inform you that you should ring back if you happen to experience a tragedy. If you take a mental note of the number and call it after her death, Lynn will be raised from the dead and become a homie. Brains. When I was younger, I thought this was a funny easter egg, but as I've gotten older I just find it heartbreaking. You get to see up close and personal the remains of Lynn's corpse having become fish food, and is a far cry from her former self. 
Now zombies are featured in almost every installment of the Saints Row series, but Lynn stands out among her undead acquaintances. Compared to zombie Carlos in Saints Row 2 that has no discernible differences to any other homie, minus the hole in his head, Lynn, on the other hand, which happens to be attached to a very loose arm, will actually pull it off and attack enemies with, has unique dialogue, brains, zombie-like movement animations, and will even eat the corpses of your enemies. What I find so unsettling about this detail is that the player has no way of knowing that Lynn is destined to become a zombie, and will have walked past signs alluding to her fate long before discovering they serve a purpose. An easily missable detail, but one that once discovered won't be forgotten anytime soon. Number 20. Land of the Dead, Road to Fiddler's Green. Not all bodies are ready to be buried. As a lover of zombies, I have watched practically every single zombie movie ever made. Little did I know at the time though that George A. Romero's Land of the Dead released in 2005 brought with it a tie-in game set before the events of the film, Land of the Dead, Road to Fiddler's Green. Road to Fiddler's Green was panned by critics for its rudimentary AI, bad hitboxes and dated graphics even for its time, but has since garnered something of a cult following, with modders creating fully voiced custom storylines, enhanced combat, a wider variety of weapons, bug fixes and so on. While the game has aged like milk, there are a few impressive details that the developers implemented, such as a reasonably sophisticated dismemberment system that allows you to cripple zombies by removing their legs, the material of each door determining how quickly zombies can break through, and one specific environmental detail that reminded players they were never truly alone. As you traverse through each level in hopes to find safe refuge in Fiddler's Green, you'll come across a desolate city filled with burned out cars, bloodstained walls, hospital bed barricades and so on. These grisly scenes indicate horrific struggles that other people went through prior to your arrival, but it turns out you're not the only person still struggling. It seems that the occupants inside several of the many body bags littering the city don't like their new home, and will try and break free to feast on you whenever you approach them. The animation looks a bit basic and isn't particularly scary, but the thought of seeing that in real life terrifies me. Someone thought to be devoid of life, coming back from the dead and viciously trying to escape so they can sink their teeth into you. What's even more unnerving is that some of the body bags won't move unless you attack the person inside. I wonder how many people have walked past them without knowing they're not actually dead, they're just waiting to be woken up. For all of the game's flaws, I cherish little details like this that help add another layer of immersion and dread to the game, and I'm one of the players that really enjoyed the game for what it was. And there you have it, 20 of the creepiest zombie details in video games. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch me, Tom, with Game Cartel reminisce about my love-hate relationship with zombies and some of my favourite details, secrets and easter eggs. How many of these did you know about? Can you think of any other creepy details? Let me know in the comments below, I would love to make a follow-up commenters edition video. Remember to stay safe, board your windows, subscribe to survive and I will see you in the next video. Thanks very much.